Next call, Dodge City. Hi. Hi. Um, this, this is Heather. Am I on? Yep, we're listening, Heather. Okay, great. Um, I'm holding a magazine, uh, Life magazine. Um, it is from, admittedly, 1997. Still, it reads, the cover reads, Why so many of us now believe the stars reflect the soul? And in big words, astrology rising. And basically, it when you read the uh, article, it says that 48% um, probably or definitely believe that uh, of those polls believe that astrology is valid. And I would just like to know kind of, um, you know, your take on that. And I guess the other thing is just um, in a more recent, I guess, uh, interview or whatever, watching Criminal Minds, saw Joe Montaigne, the actor, play, playing David Rossi and just saying, okay, your daughter was, okay, your daughter was a Leo. She's headstrong. She's this, she's that. So, I mean, it just seems to permeate the yeah. All right, Heather, we got the point. Astrology. Okay, let me try to get that one. Uh, first of all, I think that our brains are programmed, genetically programmed, to be receptive to these ideas. I think our brains are naturally attuned to look for supernatural, mystical explanations for simple objects because our ancestors, our ancestors that could do that thinking, survived. 99% of the time, this mystical thinking failed and it was totally useless, but 1% of the time, perhaps it did give sense and an order to things and allowed our ancestors to survive. I think there could even be a God gene. There we, we probably are programmed to be receptive to, to supernatural kinds of effects, and you can actually induce these using uh, physical apparatuses. It turns out that by shooting electromagnetic radiation to a certain part of the brain, you can actually elicit the God effect. You actually feel you're in the presence of a supernatural being, and this could actually be induced. Also, ep epileptic lesions of the brain have been known to change the way you think. People who have epileptic lesions believe that anything that happens, happens for a reason. Spirits, demons, ghosts. If you fall on the floor today, it's because it was meant to be that way. It's a punishment because of a spirit up there. Some people even think that epileptic lesions may have been responsible for the creation of religions. Uh, Joan of Arc, for example, some people speculated that maybe she was just mentally ill. But when you look at the transcripts of her inquisition by the British, you realize that her mind was razor sharp, battling theological questions back and forth. So some some historians have said that maybe Joan of Arc suffered from epileptic lesions. So we will have this a thousand years from now. A thousand years from now, we'll still be debating ghosts and supernatural effects because personally, I think that it's programmed into our being and there's no science gene. Where is the science gene? Where is a gene that says you have to have a scientific method? You have to use mathematics. You have to propose hypotheses and go back into the laboratory. There is no such gene. It has to be learned the hard way. So I think a thousand years from now, we'll be having questions just like that. So personally, I don't believe in astrology because after all, these stars are huge. They're, some of them are much bigger than the sun. Some of them are gigantic star systems. And why should these star systems align themselves exactly so that you'll meet a handsome stranger tomorrow? But I think a thousand years from now, there'll be conversations just like this. Dr. Kaku, several emails asking you, what is consciousness? We don't know what consciousness is. However, I can take a guess. In my book, Physics of the Future, I have to talk about artificial intelligence. At what point will machines become as smart as us? I would rank consciousness on a scale. I don't think there's such a thing as unconscious and conscious. I think that maybe even a, um, a thermostat is conscious to a degree, it's aware of its surrounding. So the first ingredient of consciousness is, is awareness of your surroundings by feedback mechanisms. I, I would say that even a bug is conscious. It probes its surroundings, looks for mates, looks for food. A thermostat measures its surrounding. I would say that's the first form of consciousness that even machines have. The second form of consciousness, I would say, is self-awareness. If you put most animals in front of a mirror, they attack the mirror. 
okay? However, certain primates will not do that. Uh, certain birds will not do that. But many animals will attack the image they see in the mirror, so a sense of self-awareness. And third, the highest form of consciousness is simulating the future. That is, running projections of the future. To the best of our knowledge, animals do not have the concept of tomorrow. For the best of our knowledge, no animal has ever been able to demonstrate a sense of really understanding future projections. Now, apes, for example, will plot to a degree. They'll think about how best to get that banana. But to the best of our knowledge, we don't think animals have the ability to project into the future. While our consciousness, if you think about it, we constantly need to do that. We say, what will happen if I rob a bank? What happens if I study? What happens if I do this? We constantly run simulations of the future in our mind. And I think that's one of the highest forms of consciousness, being able to run the videotape, create a videotape, run it forward in many different directions to project the future. This is something that we have that animals, to the best of our knowledge, do not have. Are you currently teaching a class at City College? Yes, I'm teaching an astronomy course. Uh, astronomy used to be astronomical trivia. Uh, memorize the moons of Jupiter, memorize the, the moons of Saturn. I mean, who cares? So I inherited that course. It was a very small course, 50 kids. I threw out the book. I imported all the NASA videotapes of going to Mars and flying past Jupiter and the rings of Saturn, brought in videotapes, brought in guest lecturers. Now we're up to 600 kids. Because people want to know, right? For example, sometimes people ask the question, why are people fascinated by Einstein? I would say it's because he was the first messenger from the stars. He was the one who dared to say he can explain what's happening in the heart of stars via E equals MC squared. And the stars are in our dreams. We dream about stars. We were fascinated by the night sky. And here was this man, Einstein, who said, I know, I can give you a message, a message from the universe itself. So I think that was one of the, the fascinations that people have with astronomy and with somebody like Einstein who could help to interpret the mysteries of the universe. Michio Kaku is our guest on Book TV's In Depth, about 30 minutes left in our program. Bertha in Riverside, California. Please go ahead with your question. Oh, thank you. Okay, I, I have a, just a couple of questions and comments. What is your take, sir, on the scientists uh, who have put information about our solar system and about us into a computer and asked it, considering all these things, could, could this existence have come from some non-intelligent, or, you know, just from nothing? And uh, it was, <clears throat> every time it comes up, no, impossible because of our integrated complexity involved. And um, I... Bertha, very quickly, you got to turn down that volume on your TV, but go ahead with oh, your second question. Oh, I'm sorry, question. I didn't realize I was close. Yep, 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 I yep. just wanted to ask him about um, 2012. I saw him on a show recently, and he didn't seem to think there was anything to the 2012 prophecies. Uh, all where... right, thank you, Bertha. Okay, uh, first of all, I have a radio program that airs in 130 radio stations. I had the producer, the executive producer of 2012 on my radio show, and I asked him, are you going to be around in 2013? And his answer was, and I quote, it's just a movie. It's just a movie. And let's now take it apart really quick. First of all, the Mayan calendar is cyclical. One cycle ends, another cycle begins. Yes, one cycle ends in 2012 and another cycle begins. But I think some crafty Westerners who have a tradition of apocalypse rather than cyclical universes said, hey, maybe I can write a book, maybe I can get on TV, maybe I can make a lot of money by simply deleting the fact that a new cycle begins. And if you watch the movie, you realize that the planets all align. It's called the Jupiter effect, and they start to rip the Earth apart, the poles shift. Well, the so-called Jupiter effect does happen every few hundred years. The planets do align, and even if they do align, nothing happens because the sun, for example, has a gravitational field much larger than all the planets put together. And, you know, we're still here. And that happens pretty regularly. And then in December, 
uh, of 2012, the Earth's axis points toward the center of the galaxy. And that's when it, the day when everything happens. Well, it turns out that yes, the axis of the Earth does align, but it, it aligns toward the center of the galaxy once a year. Every year, every December, there is this alignment, and we're still here. And then, not in the movie, but some people say there's a planet X, a tenth planet out there, which is going to rip all the other planets apart. Well, we've looked. You know, we really have looked. At Caltech, they catalog all the comets out there. We do see objects perhaps bigger than Pluto, but Pluto itself is rather small. So we see debris. We see comets, gigantic pieces of rock, maybe oh, a few hundred miles across, but not much else. We don't see planet X out there that's going to come barreling through our solar system, ripping up the world. So I think there is a tradition of apocalypse. You know, throughout history, people have believed in visions like this, and they've affected American history, in fact, in the 1800s, around 1830-something, where this huge meteor storm that occurred over America terrified, terrified Midwesterners. And the Millerite movement uh, started, as a consequence, believing in the apocalypse. They even had a date for the apocalypse. When the apop apocalypse came and went, nothing happened. The Millerite movement broke into many pieces. One piece became the Jehovah's Witnesses. Another piece became the Seventh-day Adventists. And a small branch of the Millerite movement eventually became the Branch Davidians, who committed mass suicide in Waco, Texas. So these religious movements have a definite link with these prophecies. And the great prophecy of the Millerite movement was a meteor shower that took place. Michio Kaku is our guest here. His books, Beyond Einstein, was his first in 1995. Hyperspace also came out that year. Visions, four years later in 1999. And then in 2005, Einstein's Cosmos. Parallel Worlds, 2006, and Physics of the Impossible, his most recent in 2008, and coming in March 2011 is... Physics of the Future, where I talk about the next 100 years in computers, medicine, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology. Arizona, Victor, you are on with Dr. Kaku. Please go ahead. Yes, sir. It's an honor to talk to you. Um, my quick question was, what's your um, theory on dreams, the scientific connection between dreams and theory? Um, reason being, you know, the mineral charts, uh, I forget what it's called, but I know that the guy that actually created that had dreamt that up. Um, the other thing is, um, I will make this really quick um, about the alien connection. Um, me, my sister, and my mother all had the same dream without realizing it until a year later. Um, it was kind of shocking and shocked the senses. I don't know what to think of that. I just don't know. If all right. Thanks, Victor. Okay, dreams are something that is not well understood by scientists. Uh, when uh, people who work in robotic theory start to build neural networks, they seem to have a dream state where they start to reorganize the things that they've learned. So when you build learning machines in the laboratory, they do seem to enter a dream state where they have to sort through all the things that they learn. So perhaps learning and dreaming are essential. That dreaming is nothing but having to reformulate and, and digest all the information that was learned that particular day. Now dreaming, of course, has a lot to do with science. Uh, the benzene ring, for example, uh, the person who created the, the pattern for the benzene ring had a dream one day where he dreamt that a snake bit its tail. And then he realized, bingo, that's the structure of the benzene molecule. So here a dream had a direct impact on, on <coughs> chemistry. I should also point out that there is a connection between dreams and even aliens. Uh, it turns out that uh, when you dream, you are paralyzed. You cannot move when, you're dream, when you dream, and that's good. Because if you could act out your dreams without paralysis, you dream walk. In fact, that's what, that's what sleepwalking is. Sleepwalking is basically uh, carrying out a dream when you are not paralyzed. Now, when you wake up in the morning, you wake up and you are refreshed and you forget about everything. However, about 5% of, of most people suffer from what is called sleep paralysis. And that is they are paralyzed when they wake up in the morning. They're in that dream state, they're still dreaming, they are paralyzed, but they are now awake. And they are terrified. They have this image of somebody on their chest bearing down on them as if they are paralyzed and they're helpless. And then they wake up and they forget about it and go about their chores. 
During the Victorian era, there are paintings, paintings of women asleep with a gremlin on their chest staring down 